Welcome everyone. We'll begin the presentation in about four minutes at six o'clock. Welcome to everyone who's joining. We'll begin the presentation in about three minutes at six o'clock. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you everyone for logging in. We'll be starting in about a minute or so after we get to six o'clock. Welcome to everyone. Thank you for logging in to our info session on elementary schools for comprehensive distance learning. Uh, my name is Greg Cascella. I'm communications and community relations in the district office, and I'm going to turn it over to our elementary school principals who will be leading us through tonight. Good evening, good evening everyone. My name is Brian Wood. I am the principal at Ewing Young Elementary School. 
We are excited to have everyone here tonight so we can share information about our comprehensive distance learning for the upcoming school year. During this meeting, you'll, you're going to hear from our superintendent, Dr. Morlock, Dr. Brown, Director of Curriculum, Ann Zeal, Director of Student Services, Dr. Neff, Director of Strategic Partnerships, Shiloh uh, Philick, Food and Nutrition, and our principals from each of the six elementary schools. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please use the question and answer button. We will be collecting those questions and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the meeting. We will be making a copy of this live session, the presentation and frequently asked questions in the following days to provide answers for many of the questions. To start the presentation, I would like to welcome Dr. Joe Morlock. Thank you, Brian. Um, so I'm glad that you're all here tonight. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, a comprehensive distance learning. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, also about how we got to the place we are uh, in offering that for this coming year and uh, a little bit about uh, what the possibilities are for the future. So, uh, of course, we know that uh, our first choice and everyone's first choice uh, would be to have uh, our kids in school every single day. Uh, we know that that's the way we've operated and that and that all, that's always our best choice for, for kids. Um, but in this uncertain time, uh, we had begun doing a lot of planning uh, around possibly opening school um, and then uh, looking at a hybrid system uh, where we would have some cohorts of kids coming in every other day. Uh, and then we also had to do some planning on uh, what's called comprehensive distance learning, which we will talk about tonight. So as you know, on the next slide, uh, the first option, of course, of bringing everybody into school uh, is no longer an option. Uh, nor is our hybrid, and I'll talk about the metrics about how we got there. And so we are focusing all of our planning efforts on comprehensive distance learning uh, to provide the best uh, opportunity for our students uh, in the coming months. So uh, we are here because of a couple of things that uh, the Department of Education uh, and State of Oregon and Oregon Health Authority uh, developed some metrics to let us know when it would be uh, safe for us to begin uh, operation in a hybrid uh, or in an in-person model. And they did do it by county primarily. So uh, there are some counties who are reaching or will reach those metrics uh, before others. And so they've tried to, to regionalize it to make it work for uh, more schools across the state. There are 197 school districts. And so each one of them has um, their own kind of set of needs uh, throughout Oregon. So the, the first metric is uh, the number of case rates per 100,000 people in the county. Uh, and the case rates must be fewer than 10 uh, per 100,000 in the county for three consecutive weeks. And that means that if you go out of, uh, if you go above 10 in week four or week five or week 12, uh, you would start the count from zero and go back into distance learning. So this is if we were uh, going to be in hybrid, we'd have to go back. Uh, so at this point, as you can see from the numbers, uh, we have uh, all three counties, uh, Washington on the, the left in each one of the bars, uh, Clackamas County in the middle and Yamhill County uh, in the yellow in the, in the uh, third bar. And we provided the, the last uh, several weeks, um, we got the, the latest data on the August uh, 9th day today. So we've added those in. And as you can see, the, the line with the arrow there, that is our 10 case uh, space. And so we are far above that. Uh, in fact, last week, uh, the August 2nd week, uh, we were at about 96 or 97 cases, which is nearly 10 times the number uh, that we would be able to be uh, considering moving toward a hybrid system. So we are far above that. And as you can see, so are Washington and Clackamas uh, counties, which our district also serves. Now we know that also uh, it's supposed to be the majority of both students and staff um, or the vast majority uh, who live in the county if you serve more than one county, uh, but none of our three counties at this time uh, reach that metric of 10 cases or fewer for three consecutive weeks. The second uh, metric that we also have to look at are the test positivity rates. And those rates on uh, tests, when people are tested uh, for the COVID disease, uh, they must be uh, lower than uh, 5% in the county and in the state for three consecutive weeks. And there are some caveats that allow us uh, if the state hasn't reached that metric. But as you can see, uh, we just recently in Yamhill County, at least for this week, uh, got below the 5% metric. Um, but by and large, we've been above that metric as many of the counties, uh, at least Washington County and the state of Oregon have been above 5%. So those two things taken together, the test positivity rate and uh, the case count per thousand 
Uh, both of those metrics uh, tell us from the guidance in the Department of Education's work uh, that we're unable to open uh, in-person classes uh, at this time. So we're going to talk about a couple of different options, and I wanted to just be clear about uh, the kind of pathways that you can look at. Uh, the option one, the one that we will spend most of the time uh, tonight discussing, is that we will be starting um, all students in a distance learning model, comprehensive distance learning. Uh, eventually, uh, if the metrics change and we're able to uh, make plans for the safe return uh, for students into the building, we would go to what's called a hybrid model, meaning that students would be uh, in school some days and uh, at home doing uh, distance learning the other days, and they would alternate, uh, and then eventually returning to all in-person school. Now, we don't have a timeline for what that looks like uh, because there are lots of things at play, and you've probably heard the phrase before that the virus makes the timeline. So we have to continue to plan uh, all of these things in parallel uh, to be ready for that. Additionally, uh, if uh, you uh, decide to go with the comprehensive distance learning model, uh, there will be an option for students to stay in distance learning if they don't wish to return or if you don't wish for them to return uh, to the hybrid or in-person system later. So the option to be in comprehensive distance learning will be uh, for the rest of the year and those who wish to return uh, would be able to do so. The second pathway is uh, starting, of course, uh, at uh, the Shehalem Online Academy, uh, COA, uh, and we're asking families to select that for minimally a, sem a full semester, uh, if not the whole year. At the semester break, if you wish to move your student into the comprehensive distance learning or hybrid model, whichever one we might be in at that time, which is near the end of January, uh, then you would be able to switch uh, at semester break from COA to our CDL, uh, comprehensive distance learning, or to uh, the hybrid model, whichever uh, system that we happen to be operating at that time. Uh, if not, you also could continue, and uh, your student could continue with Shehalem Online Academy uh, for the entirety of the school year. So again, at semester, uh, if you wish to make a change, uh, that would be possible. Uh, additionally, um, CDL will be available for all students uh, if they wish to continue throughout the year or could go to uh, the start the hybrid system uh, when that begins. And I think now that I'm turning this over to Dr. Brown, he's our director uh, of curriculum here at uh, the district. And so I will pass it to him. All right, am I on Greg? Okay, thanks Dr. Morlock and welcome everyone. Just wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk you through uh, some of the things that we'll be doing in our comprehensive distance learning model relative to the curriculum choices. Um, we're really excited to um, be rolling out some new curriculum. Uh, we spent some time this summer thinking about curricular options that would give our teachers uh, the flexibility to be able to uh, engage kids in really rich, meaningful, dynamic learning in an online space, uh, and also curriculum that's flexible enough that uh, when we get to that point in time when we can go back to either a hybrid or an in-person model that we'll be able to continue um, with this, with the same content. Uh, so in English language arts or literacy, we're gonna be using a program called Wonders, uh, which is published by a company called McGraw-Hill. Uh, they also have a companion curriculum to Wonders for our dual language students called Marabias. And so we'll be rolling both of those out uh, at kindergarten through fifth grade. We're very excited about that. Uh, for mathematics, we're gonna be using a program called Into Math, which is uh, published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Uh, we worked with them quite a bit last year uh, to learn more about their program and uh, are excited to uh, be piloting that one this year. And then for science, we're gonna be using uh, a new curriculum called TWIG, uh, published by TWIG Science. So um, our teachers came together and worked with us over the last few weeks to look at lots of different options across those core content areas. Uh, and spent uh, time providing feedback and digging in and really exploring the pros and cons of different uh, tools out there. Again, the focus really being um, what, uh, what tools have been designed to be delivered in an online fashion uh, and are rich and engaging and dynamic and, and rigorous and all the things we care about uh, in terms of learning for our kids, uh, but also flexible enough uh, for, for teachers when we end up ultimately uh, going into some other kind of format, we hope. So those are gonna be the curriculum choices that we're using in the comprehensive distance learning model. Um, there are some other curricula we'll be using uh, for uh, PE health, music, and, and some of the other content areas as well. Uh, but for the core content, uh, this is what we're looking at. And uh, we're really looking forward to um, 
uh, getting these tools uh, going and engaging uh, all your kids in learning uh, with these resources. Thank you, Dr. Brown. We're gonna just talk about the um, technology aspects of this for a moment. I have four things I wanna talk about. So um, first, digital systems wise, we are going to try to stick with the systems that many of you became familiar with in the spring. So Clever will likely still be our main hub where that will connect to all our different curriculums and everything your students need to get to. For our younger students, Seesaw will be a communication tool and a place where teachers will communicate about what's expected and what's happening in the digital classroom. And then Google Classroom will also be something that will be utilized at the upper elementary grades. Um, help desk wise, we are establishing a family help desk. So a help desk that's available to support our families. We are actually in the middle of a hiring process this week to bring on a bilingual technology support specialist just to run that help desk. So we uh, will be communicating about all of that in the next couple of weeks. Um, device wise, we want every student to have a device of their own. So a device that they can use for their learning. And if that's something that's not possible right now from the devices you have in your house, we will be communicating about how to get set up with one of those devices. Um, that will likely be, <clears throat> excuse me, distributed through your, um, your school location. And we'll be sending out some information about how to get connected to that. The last one's connectivity. And we are pretty aware that um, many families um, don't have adequate Wi-Fi or internet service where they are. So we do have a number of hotspots available for families to be able to get their students online and get them learning. And if that's something that you need, we'll be sending out some information about how to get you um, a hotspot. And if that's not working for you, we have a few other options as well. And we'll uh, send out that information. And then we also have an email address, um, support at newberg.k12.or.us that you can email and that will um, get you that information that way. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Tim Lauer. I'm the principal here at Mabel Rush Elementary School. And uh, I'm gonna share with you this evening some of the um, guiding principles of, of our plan and, and some of the work that uh, we did in terms of listening to feedback from teachers and families. And um, heard, you know, in the spring we heard many, um, we have many opportunities to talk with families and talk with teachers. And one of the things that we heard is, um, you know, consistent daily uh, connection with your teacher was very important. And so we, in our plan, in our draft plan, um, we have basically daily uh, smaller groups with each uh, teacher. So teacher basically uh, could have four groups uh, in her class and those four groups uh, would meet hourly uh, each day with the teacher. So basically the teacher would meet uh, with four separate groups, smaller numbers of students, uh, more, inter uh, more interaction with each student rather than trying to do large 24-member uh, class Google Meet kind of video lessons. We found those really did not work very well uh, for daily instruction with math and with reading. So uh, the highlights of our plan are uh, daily teacher-led uh, English language arts reading lessons uh, four days a week. Uh, math lessons led by teachers four days a week. Uh, those would be live sessions. In addition, science and social studies blocks uh, would, would be uh, part of this schedule. And, and in a few moments, we'll go through a kind of sample schedule. Um, physical education, music, and library will actually be with your building-based uh, teachers in those areas. So that was an area that we heard last year that uh, we miss that daily or that weekly interaction with our music and PE and library folks. So we will be working, uh, our, our schools will be working directly with those teachers and our students will. Uh, social emotional work, uh, incorporating the work of our counselors that will be a part of this schedule. And then daily teacher office hours for family and student contact uh, to, for follow up for additional support and that type of thing. And then the next slide um, is, is basically kind of an overview of what a teacher's day might be. So for example, we mentioned the four groups 
And uh, those will be scheduled throughout the day uh, spaced. So teachers, again, will be working um, with four groups of students. Roughly, if you're say like a class of 24 students, you're looking at six students at a time. In addition, students who receive special education or English language development support will also have opportunities within the structure of the day to work uh, with their instructors in those areas also. Uh, in addition, we mentioned the 45 minutes per day of, of teacher interaction with the class in terms of office hours. And then Fridays, uh, we're planning larger group kind of whole sessions uh, of an hour again, so that basically that would allow us to, to build some class community because we will be working for the most part in, in smaller groups. Okay, and uh, I'm going to pass this over to uh, Reed Langdon from uh, Dundee and he's going to talk a little bit about the schedule. Can we go back one slide, please? Thank you. So it, this would be an, a sample schedule for um, group A. As Mr. Lauer had indicated, there would be four different groups, an A group, a B group, a C group, and a D group that um, teachers would be working with throughout the day. And so this would be, well, one of the things we heard from folks is that the schedule needs to have live teaching time with teachers each day, but it also needs to have some flexibility because some of you are trying to help your child with school and you're working. And so there may be sessions that are hard to catch or, or those kind of things. So we wanted some flexibility here. So here's, here's how a schedule could look like. 7.30 to 8.30, you get up in the morning, you have breakfast and you log on to Seesaw or Google Classroom to see if your teachers posted any announcements for the day or anything you need to be aware of. And then from 8.30 to 9.30 for group A, this would be their whole group live learning. And so that would be when a group of about six students meets with their teacher. They maybe have a mini lesson in English language arts, a mini lesson in math. The teacher's checking for understanding. They may be walking them through their assignments for the rest of the day. And that happens for about an hour. From 9.30 to 10.30 could be time where students are working on their English language arts assignment they received from their teacher earlier. And it could also be time where students are working with their special education support, um, whether it be you know, in English language arts or math or speech or um, English language development or whatever it is they need in that time. We scheduled some break times in just as a suggestion because we all need those. Um, specials from 1050 to 1130 would be, again, as Mr. Lauer said, with your building folks. So if you're a student at Crater, for instance, it'd be with Crater's music PE and library teacher. Um, 1130 to 1230 is for lunch or brain break chores if you have them for your kids and just some time to rest. Um, 1230 to one would be some grade level specific practice. So each grade level has some different things they're, they're working on. Maybe it's some handwriting or in second grade, for instance, we like to see students start learn how to type. So there's a keyboarding program they could use. Maybe they're doing some independent reading. Um, there's lots of things that could happen in that time. One o'clock to 1.30 would be into math. So the neat thing about the math program we're using is there's some guided practice for students based on their rate and level. So they take a short placement test at the beginning and then they're able, it differentiates for them a little bit so they can practice skills that's been identified that they need. 1.30 to two, another break. 2.30 to three would be science and social studies and those would be done independently. The teacher would push out a lesson that um, students would be able to try some sort of science experiment or some reading, um, social studies, those kind of things. And then 2.30 to 3.15 would be that time for office hours where you could call in with questions or, you know, maybe your child thought they got the math assignment, they had it all figured out, and then they forgot because that happens to us sometimes. And so they could go in and get some, some extra practice and some extra help during that time. So if we move over to group B, Group B is going to look, have all the same components group A did. It's just that that whole group live learning moves. So from 930 to 1030 would be that time where they would meet with their teacher. And the other things are all in the schedule just as they were before. Teacher office hours always stay the same from 230 to 315. So if we go to group C, same thing, your live learning session moves to 1030 to 1130. And if we go to group D, Group D would go ahead and, and the live learning session would be 1230 to 130. 
Again, you're going to see maybe that the grade level specific practice is at a different time or um, the specials are at a different time, those recorded lessons. And again, those are for you to kind of consume as makes sense to you and your family. Um, that can, it doesn't have to be at that specific time, but it's just a suggestion uh, of a schedule. If we can move on to the Friday schedule here, Fridays look a little bit differently than the rest of the week. One of the things we know is that we really felt strongly about having small groups of kids receive instruction so that we can really make sure they're getting it and understanding um, what they're doing. But we also recognize that it's really important to get kids together um, in their whole class because they miss each other and they want to see each other and you know check on each other's weeks and things like that. So on Fridays from 10.30 to 11.30 is a whole class social emotional lesson and check-in. So it's a time for all four of those groups to get together and talk with their teacher and meet and see each other because we think that's really, really important. The teacher office hours are still there at 2.30 to 3.15. And then there's still some of those times to practice some grade level practice, some into math, some reading, things of that nature are still there. So I hope that uh, kind of showed you what a schedule could look like. And now I'm going to turn it over to John McAndrews at Crater, who's going to talk to you about CDL versus COA. Thanks, Mr. Langdon. Uh, so I'm John McAndrews. I'm the principal over at Crater. Uh, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes here walking you through some of the major, or comparing the uh, comprehensive distance learning and the uh, Chehalem Online Academy. So they're both good programs, um, but do offer a little bit different experiences for our families. So in, in the instance, if we were able to return to school for hybrid learning, I know that's um, a question has been about what are my options if I select um, either of these programs. Uh, again, that would have to be under the, uh, you know, we've met the metrics that Dr. Morlock outlined a little bit earlier. Uh, under the comprehensive distance learning model, parents uh, have a choice. They can either return to their neighborhood schools to participate in that case uh, in a hybrid class on site, or parents can choose to stay in the distance learning model. So they um, we wouldn't require them to come back in if they wanted to stay in that distance model. Uh, on the in the Chehalem Online Academy, uh, it does require uh, the full semester commitment. So just uh, know that up front with Chehalem Online uh, does ask for one semester at a time. Um, both allow for an online learning opportunity for students and utilize curriculum that are, uh, as Dr. Brown was talking about, are, are designed for a digital platform. And so that, that's difference for our distance learning this spring that, um, or this fall that we didn't have available in the spring. Uh, Chehalem Online uses uh, a different science and math curriculum than the comprehensive distance learning program we'll be using. Um, in comprehensive distance learning uh, model, uh, your child's teacher will be the one that's uh, preparing lessons and providing instruction in all content areas. Uh, and this is the, your child's teacher from your neighborhood school. In the uh, Chehalem Online Academy, uh, it offers support from teachers who work in the Newburgh School District. Um, but it uh, does ask that parents are providing the uh, daily instruction in the content areas. And so parents are uh, in Chehalem Online Academy are learning how to use the curriculum in this model and they become the, the primary teacher of the content. Uh, a few other differences to note uh, with comprehensive distance learning, it does, uh, as Mr. Langdon was walking you through, it offers daily live online lessons from your child's teacher. Uh, they provide uh, assessment and feedback specific to your child's needs. Uh, the comprehensive distance learning offers, uh, the, again, the daily office hours that are, are built into each day, uh, allows child to have to access their teacher for additional questions and support. Uh, the comprehensive distance learning also provides weekly specials in the area of music and PE. And these are again taught by the specialists from your child's uh, school. Uh, these those uh, content areas are are not going to be offered in the Chehalem Online Academy. So just uh, just some differences there. Uh, again, one of the again the primary differences between the models and comprehensive distance um, learning uh, is that your your child's teacher is the one who's responsible for teaching and learning, and are the teaching and assessment and providing feedback for your child's learning. Uh, in Chehalem Online, again, it's uh, the parents are, are the ones that are um, using the curriculum to teach their children. Uh, Chehalem Online Academy is going to require a little bit more time commitment 
um, from the fam from parents as far as because there is that uh, delivery of the instruction uh, piece that in the comprehensive distance learning we um, um, provide at the school level. Uh, the comprehensive distance learning model, it's, it's recommended for most families who might be used to um, more of the traditional classroom uh, approach where the teacher is the primary instructor and they want to stay more connected with their local neighborhood school. Uh, so those are, again, just wanted to share some of the, the major differences in the programs and, uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mrs. Bailey. She's going to discuss future planning for us. Thank you, Mr. McAndrews. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Jen Bailey, the principal at Joe and Austin Elementary. Um, we wanted to just be able to share, as John mentioned, just some of our next steps um, to stay connected and continue to build relationships with our families in Newburgh. Um, at the end of this presentation, we will be sharing out the questions um, from parents and families, and we hope to address your wonderings and clarify exactly what comprehensive distance learning looks like for you and your child or your children. Um, so what is next? Um, usually we have kindergarten jumpstart for incoming kindergarten students two weeks before starts. Because we cannot use this model, we will be instead planning and scheduling neighborhood visits. Um, a new way of thinking, um, but alongside um, kindergarten teachers, it could be a school counselor or principal or other specialists um, who will visit your yard, your neighborhood um, to get to know you, to introduce themselves. Um, to meet your child, of course, and to drop off the technology that's needed to get started in the fall. The district is also supplying a kindergarten kit to each child filled with the necessary supplies um, to be ready to learn from home. So we're looking forward to that and kindergarten teachers will be reaching out to families to connect and look at that first week. We also um, know that many of you are eager to hear about who your child's teacher is for this coming year. And I bet your children are also wondering what groups they're in and who um, all their friends that they miss. And we realize it's hard to wait and we appreciate your patience on this. Um, behind the scenes, every school has been meeting with their design team to work through this process and to build those student groups. And these student groups are um, being created right now um, and in process and created by all school stakeholders. So teachers, the administration, the counselors, the specialists. And we want to thoughtfully create small groups that will support every child in the way that they need. Um, we're also paying close attention to connecting families, um, especially if you have multiple kids at one elementary school um, and also thinking about connecting our families across elementary, middle and high school. And these groups, um, once um, confirmed, we're gonna be emailing and mailing those out on September 4th to every family. Also in the planning, um, because we know how important that first week back is in building relationships. Um, the first and through fifth grade teachers are gonna be coordinating and meeting virtually with all of their students and parents that week. And we know that these first few days are really important and um, you know, starting the journey of that distance learning together as a team is key to our success. And lastly, um, we also know there are many questions about supply lists. Um, student supply lists and materials, you know, they are gonna be different than a normal school year. Um, we are finalizing those lists and we will get them posted for everyone um, this Friday, August 21st, and they'll be on the district website and our school websites. All right, so I'm gonna turn this over to Shiloh Fisick to share about food services and some updates. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm the Director of Nutrition Services for Newburgh Public Schools and just kind of wanted to talk through what um, this fall brings um, for our food service program. We are having to shift back to an NSLP model, which is National School Lunch Program or used to of having paid meals or families fill out free and reduced eligibility paperwork to receive free meals. Um, I want to uh, point out that we do have one elementary, which is Edwards Elementary, that is a community eligibility provision, which all students that are enrolled at Edwards do eat for free breakfast and lunch. Um, however, if you have multiple students through grade levels like middle school and high school and still have um, a student at Edwards, we still encourage you to fill out free and reduced eligibility to get your whole family covered. Uh, we sent an email out this Monday, uh, kind of a breakdown of the free and reduced lunch application. 
And Oregon came out with an expanded income guideline, which encompasses a little bit more. Um, so if a household of two on a federal free and reduced can't make more than 32,000 a year, the Oregon expanded income guideline, um, it goes up to 51,720. So, <clears throat> excuse me, my son in the background. So we're going to be, food will be delivered by bus um, Wednesday and Friday. We took in consideration of what families were having to go through during this time and um, wanted to bring meals to families with juggling online curriculum for their students. Um, so we uh, communicated in our communication on Monday, there is a survey that you can fill out to request for delivery options. And um, if you have any questions, you can call 503-554-4725. Thank you. All right. I know that there are a lot of questions and there have been a lot that have been filling up in the question and answer session. So I have been answering the ones that I know for sure are definitive um, and you can find those underneath the answer tab. And then there's a whole bunch of other ones um, that I've sort of tried to combine and put together because there were a lot of overlapping questions and I will bring those out verbally now and direct them either to principals or whoever might answer that. But if I guess wrong at who it's directed to, please anybody else jump in to answer uh, as required. Um, one of the questions uh, that is a big one is how will these groups um, be created? Are you able to keep families uh, students together? Are parents able to request for groups of friends or pods uh, to be together? Can they choose morning or afternoon? Um, and how is it going to work when we go back to hybrid? Will they stay the same? Will they be in these groups the whole year? So maybe one of the principals could tackle um, some of the considerations you're giving as you're creating these groups. I think the big thing when, um, and other principals feel free to jump in here, but I think the big thing when we're making these groups is we want to make sure that we're making them um, with a variety of students. We don't want to just put any student that's in like an IEP in one group or, or something like that. We want to make sure it's a, it's a diverse group of students. Um, will people be able to um, request? You can send us an email if you like. It's sort of like when we do class placements every year. Um, Sometimes people will ask for a class placement and we do our best to try to accommodate that, but we might not be able to just because of um, the volume of requests we get or, or that kind of thing. Um, but if there's a specific need, um, I would say feel free to email us um, at your building and let us know what that is and, and we'll do our best. Greg, I don't know. There is a lot in that question. Is there stuff that I missed? In general, what are you trying to um, keep together as you're creating these groups? Uh, like, for instance, are you trying to keep families together? That's a common question that's coming through. Um, yes, I think we are. To try and make sure people are kind of on a consistent schedule for their family, because it's hard to manage when we all have a different schedule. I think at the same time, um, if there's it's going to depend on what the family needs, perhaps, because I can think about um, if, you know, for instance, um, Wi-Fi bandwidth at a home is, is difficult where only one person can be on at a time or something like that. We may need to think about that as we design. But in general, we'd like to keep the schedule as close as we can. I think, I'm sorry, this is uh, Tim Lauer from Mabel Rush. I think each family is going to have a unique situation. For example, as Reed mentioned, bandwidth can be an issue. So if if we have a second grader and a fourth grader and we put them in cohorts such that they're both on at nine o'clock in the morning, that might be a problem for that family. And so those are the kind of things that, um, you know, we're going to need to hear from families. And it, it's, it, I think as um, Jen Bailey mentioned, um, it is quite an endeavor, uh, quite an undertaking to, to try to do this, but we want to make this work for families as best we can. And, and I would just add on, I heard part of the question was um, long term is we are thoughtfully trying to create these the small four groups um, with the idea of it rolling into hybrid. 
And so thinking collectively about group A, B, C, and D, and then do we combine groups A and B once we get to, you know, 12 to 15 kids that can be present, um, all the way down the road to combining all four cohorts. So we've tried to do a little backwards design there and um, uh, be thoughtful about it. Thank you all. Uh, and again, as, um, as Jen said in the presentation, we are going to be having those class lists out by September 4th. So you know then when your schedule is for your particular student, we recognize that's a huge thing that you need to arrange for. And we're going to get those out absolutely as quickly as we can. And, and just there's a lot of complications because we're also looking at family groupings across schools as well um, for people who might be in middle school or high school in the same family. So it's a big endeavor that we're tackling. Uh, one of the other questions, I think I'm going to direct this to uh, Dr. Morlock. Um, a lot of questions about will we be recording the live sessions in case students are not able to be at the live session? It's a great question. Uh, my answer is we don't know yet. Uh, there are some complications uh, around student privacy and about posting videos. And so we have some things that we have to work through um, as uh, well as um, you know uh, places to find them, how they get into them. So. We have uh, still some work. We don't have clarity on that yet. Uh, we know that that's a, a need that's come up and a request that's come up from families. And so we are actively uh, exploring how to do that and how to do it um, with privacy in mind uh, and to make them available. So we don't have a specific answer yet, but we have, we have heard you uh, that that's something that's important uh, to our families. Um, maybe I'll start this question toward Dr. Brown and then other principals uh, may fill in with that, this as well. Uh, several questions asking about um, if there will be written materials provided or paper and pencil curriculum or if they're going to be in front of the computer all day and hopefully seeing the schedule and recognizing that um, there are just some live components that are in front of the video and then there's other applied work that will be done in other ways. Um, I don't know um, Derek, if you can tackle at all about written materials or how that's going to work. Yeah, I sure can. Uh, and a great question, and I should have brought it up. It was a point that I forgot to make. Yes, uh, we are going to be providing uh, hard copy materials uh, for those core content areas. Um, I know that our teachers and our administrators uh, care a lot about trying to make sure that we're balancing uh, what learning looks like at home in terms of uh, screen time versus other applied work, as Greg just mentioned. Uh, so for those curriculum choices that we talked about uh, earlier in the presentation, we are uh, also purchasing, um, you know, workbooks and things like that that are going to come home to kids. So again, uh, you know, kids will be able to log into their Google Classroom uh, to find, to engage with their teacher to find out what tasks they have for the week and, and what assignments and so on and so forth. Some of that will be uh, online in a digital kind of space and then there will be other things that are associated with uh, using other resources like uh, workbooks and things like that. Maybe and one other thing that wasn't asked in that question but I want to make sure I say before I forget um, all the materials that we're purchasing are, are fully available in Spanish as well. And related I think you really answered this but but someone did ask this so just to make it crystal clear they're asking about supplementary or practice materials that go along with the curriculum will that be something the district is providing or will parents have to come up with that on their own. Um, we are providing supplemental materials as well. Um, our, our administrators uh, and teachers have been giving us feedback on uh, you know which specific supplementary materials will be most useful. Um, we know that the core uh, curriculum materials we're buying are also very comprehensive. So we want to we want to make sure teachers and students have supplementary materials, but we also want to make sure we're using the core curriculum um, as extensively as we can. But there will be supplementary materials available, um, and you'll hear about that uh, through your uh, through your teachers. Thank you. Um, and I'm not sure exactly who to direct this question to. This is just one of the hard things that we talk about every day and have difficulty finding good solutions to. But a lot of questions asking, what support will there be for families who work? What support will there be for, for families who don't have student who don't have adults at home to help their students get online and to do the work? Um, I don't know if there's anybody who wants to try to tackle that one. I think one thing I would say regarding that is um, that's part of our work on Fridays and why we didn't do 
um, as many live sessions on Fridays. So if we see that, um, you know, we haven't seen you online or, or um, we're gonna be making some phone calls just to see how we can help and what do you need. I also think um, Luke talked about the helpline that you can call in and get some help there as well. And then the teacher office hours would be some time where you can um, call in and get, a student could call in and get some help, especially in the upper grades. I would just add on as well, just um, even though we're not in person, um, office, our incredible secretaries are always available as usual. And so just calling the school for any concern you have or question you have, um, we're always available and wanna work with you and your family um, to make things um, better or more efficient or whatever comes up. So whether it's curriculum or technology or just a question you have, um, we're still gonna be available all the time. Thank you all. I can. I just need to give warning right now that we're not going to be able to get to all of the questions. I'm going to do our best to get to the ones that are important. Um, we published being done at 6:45. We can maybe go at the most to 6:50 because we have to get ready for the high school, middle school one that starts at seven. Um, a lot of questions about how will attendance be taken? How will that be addressed? What if a student can't attend a live session? Will they be penalized? Will there be follow-up about attendance in some way? Uh, I'm not sure who to direct that question to, but put that one out there. Well, I, uh, this is Scott over at Edwards. I know I've talked with teachers here, and I think that's part of the, the work of kind of what Mr. Langdon was talking about, where we'd have a, a small team here at the school really working towards connecting with those kids that haven't shown up. So, you know, the, the time being that one group session, if a kid doesn't come there, that will be one of the reasons why a teacher or somebody in the office might want to reach out and just check on how things are going. Um, so I know at Edwards, we're looking at a group, a student care group that would be in charge, probably centering around our new assistant principal, uh, David Jaimez, and our counselor. Yeah, I would just second that and say that if there are barriers that are getting in the way, you know, we're, we're here to partner with families and our goal is to try to help uh, remove those for you and try to uh, provide the best experience for, for all of our kids. So if there's anything that I can do or office secretaries or counselors, uh, you know, we're going to work closely with families and make connections and um, help you to address those needs. Yeah, this is uh, Tim Lauer from Able Rush. I think to echo what my colleagues have said, uh, you know, this is different than spring. You know, spring was was a kind of an emergency kind of thing. This is more like real school. So in terms of uh, attendance and those type of things, we will be uh, as as those come up, we will very quickly move to help support families and find ways to to provide the supports that are needed to make sure kids are attending and kids are learning. Um, but it is something that is, um, is quite a bit different than it, than it was last spring. And related to that, there, there will be regular grades for this time, right, Tim? Thank you. Um, I think, Anne, I'll direct this one to you. A lot of questions about um, IEPs and students with, with IEPs. How will that work? How will they be followed up on? So maybe you could just give a brief overview of, of how that's being handled. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, I saw a couple of questions in the question and answer box. Um, one of them was for um, students enrolling in COA, the Shehalem Online Academy. Will students still get their speech services from their speech pathologist? And the answer to that would be yes. Uh, same with other special education services. And then I saw another question in the in the chat box that said, um, can we have IEP meetings prior to the school and meet with our child's case manager? Um, we are having all of our case managers going through all of their students' IEPs when they start back on the 31st. We'll be doing some trainings and then they're going through all their um, service minutes and um, looking at our scheduling. We're already scheduling out um, students on our, on our boards and trying to figure out different ways to group them. Um, 
So as soon as they're through looking at them and looking at what their services look like in a distance learning model, they'll be um, making phone calls and setting up different meetings with parents. Some may need to have meetings and others may not. You might have a student who has speech services for 20 minutes twice a week and we would totally be able to do those types of IEPs without needing to have a meeting and they will be doing most of their services teletherapy. I didn't see any other questions unless you had found some others, Greg. One just came up. Are we still using an EL push-in model? So maybe just talk a little bit about EL and what that will look like. So, so EL is um, a, a co-teaching model. In distance learning, it definitely looks a little bit different depending on the grade levels. So um, we're still working on those schedules is what I'll tell you. Um, but some will be push in for the most part. Um, a few will have some pull out, but it will be integrated with their ELA instruction. So it wouldn't be a separate thing. Do you have any more? Um, yes, but I'm having trouble <laughs> kind of sorting through all the ones and picking up what's most important. Um, I'll just reiterate again that um, what we're we're going to try to do is um, I've captured all these and we'll be working starting Thursday, releasing a frequently asked questions document that will continually be updated um, as we have more information. Um, and just, you know, want to just ask for your patience. And I'm sorry we have to keep saying that. Like, I, I know everybody wants to know and needs to know this information. And we're we will do the absolute best we can to get this information out. So Thursday morning, the reason we're waiting till Thursday morning is tomorrow night we have all of our Spanish language sessions and we wanna make sure to have those recorded and being able to be posted at the same time so that everybody has equal access to the information. So Thursday morning, we will have these recorded sessions all available online. We'll have the slideshow available online and we'll have the first uh, version of the written frequently asked questions. Um, and as always, you can email um, us here at the district office or, or your particular principal with the um, email addresses on the screen to be able to ask any further questions. A couple questions about enrollment or moving or changing addresses, are schools open? Secretaries are just coming back this week. So I would encourage you to email or call your schools with any of those types of things. And uh, they will get to it as soon as they can as they work through the backlog of emails from the summer while they've been out. Anything else from any of the principals or district staff before we end the session? Uh, just that, uh, so this is Joe Morlock. Um, just thanking you again for your patience as we work through these. There are lots and lots of details. You've brought up a lot of good questions tonight uh, in the Q&A that we see. Uh, we'll have more information, of course, on our FAQs. Uh, so make sure to take a look at those. Uh, email your principal. Uh, we're putting in a lot of opportunities and ways for you to be able to connect with your child's teacher. Um, you know, virtual phone numbers and emails and uh, you know, office hours and things like that. So we really want to make this uh, work for you and your family. Um, we are uh, working on all those levels of detail. If you have other questions about those, please reach out uh, and let us know because uh, it may be something we maybe not have yet thought of or we have thought of them and, and we're getting closer to uh, giving you an answer. So uh, thanks again for all of your patience. Uh, and also, we're really looking forward to doing this. I know it'll um, it'll be different than what we've done before, uh, but we can get through this and, and do a good job. And I'm proud of the work that uh, our folks, our staff have been really uh, putting into to making this the best opportunity we can. So um, without anything else, Greg? I, I, I will jump in with one more answer to a question. This was addressed during the presentation, but it was asked, and this is an important one. For students who uh, choose the CDL model, uh, when the time comes that we are able to move back to some kind of in-person learning in a hybrid model, there will still be an option within CDL to stay all online. If you, for various reasons with your family, do not feel comfortable having your student back in in-person learning when we make that choice, you will still be able to stay uh, online. Uh, we're, you know, 
there may be some changes to that online system when we get to that point, depending on how staffing goes. But we just want to be clear that that will be an option for the entire year to folks, that there will be some kind of completely online version open, not just with COA, but within the comprehensive distance learning model. And with that, I think I need to end our session so that we can start up for the next one. So thank you all very much.